director of the Center for Free Expression, I'd like to welcome you uh, to what I think is going to be a very interesting event tonight uh, with a provocative title, Learning When Not to Shut Up. Uh, what's not mentioned is the sub-subtitle, sub which is, what does freedom of expression look like for Canadian kids? You know, we have lots of challenges about freedom of expression in society, but we rarely ask, except for our speaker tonight, uh, about what it means for kids. And it's not only what it means for kids, but in another part of the center's life, we're concerned what it means for people who work with kids. Uh, I would argue there's probably no group of employees who have more restricted speech rights than teachers. Not only during the day in the school, for some obvious reasons, but in terms of their life outside the school. Uh, and so that's another topic for another night that the center deals with. But uh, I think it's the restrictions we put on our kids sort of morph out to the broader community of those who work with kids. In any case, um, tonight uh, I'd like to uh, welcome our speaker and our discussant. But before that, Ange, can you? Um, the center puts on about 12 events a year public events like this, as well as we do a film series of, of film every month. And if you'd like to be on the email list just to receive notice of any of the events, Ange Holmes, who's the coordinator of the center, is just passing around a clipboard. You can just put your name and email address on and we'll add you. We don't overwhelm you with email, but if you'd like to receive notices, you can do that. Our speaker tonight is a hero of mine. Uh, uh, quite an amazing person, uh, Danielle McLaughlin, who describes herself as having been a civil liberties advocate since she was old enough to say, that's not fair. Which was what, three? <laughs> Four? <laughs> so she was on her career path at two and a half, she claims. Uh, she was the director of education for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association and Education Trust from 1988, I think, till about 2016. Uh, and she worked closely with a person who many of you will know of, if you didn't know him, and that was Alan Borovoy, who was the executive director of the CCLA for many years and one of the leading figures on free expression in Canada. And she developed and helped develop many of the programs and resources uh, specifically oriented to teachers and students uh, to think critically about their rights and freedoms. Uh, she's been particularly concerned about the loss of freedom of, of expression experienced by teachers and students in our education system. Um, she's a prolific writer. She's one of the bloggers for the Center for Free Expression. So on our website, which is cfe.ryerson.ca, we have a blog and we have 15 or so fairly distinguished folks who write for it. None writes more regularly and more cogently than Danielle. But she also writes lots of other things. She, um, she wrote an earlier book called That's Not Fair, Getting to Know Your Rights and Freedoms that was published by Kids Can Press as their 2016 Citizen Kid Book for Children. This is for kids grades two to six. And I think it's harder to write for kids in grade two to six than it is to write for adults, so it's no mean achievement. She's also co-author with her son of a book called That's Not Fair, uh, website videos for children age seven to 11. Uh, tonight, in addition to her talk, we're launching her book uh, entitled F Freedom of Expression, Deal With It Before You Are Censored. And we have copies at the back if anyone would like to purchase one for $25. It's a wonderful book. There's a little quiz or two in here. And I'm not sure that most of the adults in the room would pass the quiz, let alone most of the kids. Uh, and Danielle afterwards will be happy to autograph any books if you'd like. Uh, so, Danielle, why don't you come up here, and then I'll introduce your partner in crime for this evening. Uh, so, Danielle's going to talk, and then Kara Zwiebel, uh, who I'll introduce in a second, is going to have a conversation with Danielle and be sort of a discussant, raise some difficult questions, and the two of them will, will have what I think will be an interesting conversation, and then we'll bring the audience into that conversation. Kara is the Director of Fundamental Freedoms Program at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. She joined the CCLA in, in 2009 as director of that program. She's a graduate of McGill University with an honors degree in political science. She has her Bachelor of Law degree from Osgood Hall. She was obviously a superb student because she articled 
uh, as a law student with uh, the Honorable Justice Ian Binney at the Supreme Court of Canada. Very few law students get to article with Supreme Court judges, uh, before calling to the Ontario Bar in 2005. Then she uh, went to New York University as an Arthur T. Vanderbilt scholar, where she got her Master of Laws degree. Prior to joining the CCLA after that, she was an associate at a national law firm practicing public law, health law, and commercial litigation. And she has experience representing all levels of clients before, or rather representing clients before all levels of courts and administrative tribunals, and has authored and co-authored uh, a number of publications on constitutional law. Her work at the CSCLA involves providing legal opinions and research, and there's, given the governments we have these days, there seem to be a lot of potential legal opinions and research that's necessary, coordinating interventions, and there's certainly a need for a lot of intervening, and representing the CCLA before the courts. There's certainly a need for actually appearing before the courts and litigating, as well as preparing submissions to legislative bodies and assisting the Education Trust, the CCLA, CCLA's uh, Education Trust in its public education work. So I'd like to welcome Kara to come up and join um, Danielle, and uh, I'll turn it over to Danielle. Is this on? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Oh, okay. I don't have to do anything. Okay. Well, I thank you so much, all of you, for being here. It's it's a real treat, and you you have to understand how much hubris it takes for me to get up having Kara here because um, I uh, yeah uh, she knows everything and I pretend to. It works quite well that way. <laughs> Um, I, I would like to mention um, the illustrator of this book, I, and I had hoped that the illustrator is here. I, I thought that might be you. This is uh, Paris, and, and if you get a chance to look at this, you will see how wonderful the illustrations are. They, they are um, uh, all sorts of characters. It looks to me a lot like Toronto, because there's every sort of character and getting into every sort of trouble. So that's... Uh, uh, would you do that? Would you mind standing up for a moment, Paris? <laughs> uh, a fabulous illustrator. I would like to talk about freedom of expression and kids, and they don't usually get spoken about in the same sentence, because most people really don't want to hear from kids. They, you know, they, they can be a right pain in the rear end. Um, but they face about as much um, restriction on freedoms as prisoners. Um, we compel kids to go to school, first of all. Then we compel them to dress in a certain fashion. We compel them to speak in a certain fashion, to use words, and then very carefully not to use words. Um, they face all kinds of censorship, but not the sort of censorship that we're accustomed to. They face the kind of censorship that is behavioral. But because it is a school doing this, um, and we're talking here specifically about public schools that are government bodies, we have the expectation then that somehow these kids who are being um, held back in many ways against their, their own better judgment will somehow get out of school and then they're going to be right there fighting for our rights. Well, good luck with that. Um, I think what we need to look at is how can you engage kids early on in understanding what their rights and freedoms mean, how those rights and freedoms are useful, um, and how they are being censored. Because very often we tell them they aren't. You know, we will say to kids, for example, oh, we have a no hats rule in this school. And um, some kids really like wearing hats, but we tell them, no, you can't wear a hat in school because it's disrespectful. We never ask them to break that down. To whom is it disrespectful? Does that mean that if you take your hat off, you are automatically showing respect? Um, are all hats disrespectful? If they are, what do we say about people who wear religious head coverings? Is that disrespectful or is that respectful? And how can you tell the difference? 
the act of engaging kids in critical thinking is something that we really need to do in order to have a future. So I'm just going to read a little bit from the book that Paris so wonderfully illustrated. And um, I'm just to give you an idea of what I think. <laughs> so freedom might depend on you. It would be nice if everyone could just agree about how the world should be, but they don't. Rules or demands that everyone be the same could keep you from standing up for your own rights. There are basic, basic things that you can do to make sure that everyone has the right to be who they are, including you. Feel free to disagree, but don't prevent others from expressing themselves. Support the rights of someone whose side you disagree with by letting people know what you think as well. Just like during debates, each side needs time to say what they think. When you see or hear racist, sexist, or anti-religious expression, let the speaker know that equality is as important as freedom of expression. Can you take attention away from ideas you don't like without shutting down the speakers? This is something schools are very poor at. When they hear expression they don't like, their first reflex is to ban it, to stop it, to censor it, instead of saying, well, why are you saying what you're saying? And could we perhaps explore this in a way that we both might learn something uh, from one another? Um, for example, there were some kids in Nova Scotia who uh, started the pink shirt day that we all have uh, enjoyed. It's an anti-bullying day. There was a boy who wore a pink shirt to school who was bullied, called homophobic names, and then the next day, Nearly everyone in the school wore pink shirts. Uh, the students everywhere now fight bullying and celebrate their freedom of expression by wearing pink shirts on a particular day every year. This was started by a group of kids who decided they weren't going to put up with other kids telling somebody what not to wear. That wasn't going to be good enough. But they used it in a very positive fashion to develop an idea. And I think that. We see kids doing that more than we like to admit. We see that kids can very often use negative experiences. Now, when I was working at CCLA, we would get calls from time to time. I would get calls from time to time from um, families whose kids had been censored for one reason or another. Um, they had uh, posted something uh, on the uh, school bulletin board. They had um, uh, refused to stand for the national anthem, which is, uh, I, I was very happy to see in the news, I believe, this week. There was a child in um, Nunavut who uh, was really objecting to the fact that there was very little uh, indigenous history being taught in his school, and he chose not to stand for the national anthem. He um, uh, got numbers of his other uh, friends in his class to agree that this might be a, a good technique. And the last I heard was the school was discussing whether they should be playing the national anthem at all. There, have, there, there is an assumption that you've got to do it. The fact is, you don't. There are rules and regulations about the national anthem. I believe that it actually says you've got to play it once a year um, during an assembly. So you know, if you think about this, we always do things this way, this is a, not a great thing to teach kids. You know, I, I, I like to tell the story about um, a man who was being taught how to cook by his grandmother. Um, and she was teaching him how to make a roast. And she said, well, here's what you do. You take the roast, you cut the end off, you put it in the pan, and then you put it in the oven. And so he did that for years. And then he went back to his grandmother and he said, you know, I've never been able to figure out why we cut the end off the roast. Why do we do that? She said, I don't know. My mother always did it. And so mother was still living. She asked, so he went to his great grandmother and he said, why do we cut the end off the roast? She said, oh, I never had a pan big enough. <laughs> so we may still be trying to solve the problems that don't need being solved any longer. So we have to think critically. Um, you know, I like to use the first section of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and Kara forgives me for this, for teaching kids about 
how to think about what is a reasonable limit. You know, it, it, this is a, this wonderfully Canadian thing that we have. The, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which has only been with us since 1982, and when you're my age, that's not that long. Um, it starts out by telling you, before it even tells you what your rights and freedoms will be, it says to you, you know, every one of your rights and freedoms will be subject to reasonable limits as demonstrably justified by law in a free and democratic society. So you think, okay, what's reasonable mean? So, you know, I usually like to ask kids, can you go home and ask your mother what reasonable means and then tell me tomorrow whether you agree with that? Um, and most of the time they don't, um, you know. What is reasonable to me isn't going to be reasonable probably to anyone else. Um, I've had grandchildren growing up in my house. I can tell you that what was reasonable for me was certainly not reasonable for them. <laughs> so what's it doing in the law, for goodness sakes? We know we're going to disagree about what's reasonable. And yet, it's this wonderfully Canadian thing because it really says, excuse me, you know, before we take away your rights, we're going to limit them. But don't worry, it's always going to be reasonable. You know, well, this is just, you know, this is the ultimate Canadian thing. But it's a wonderful opportunity to get kids to ask hard questions. How do you know if something is reasonable? Well, let's take any kind of school regulation that, that we're accustomed to. I just mentioned standing for the national anthem. I mentioned removing hats. So why do we do those things? And often you're, you're told, well, it, it's respectful. So does that work? Do we find that when people sing the national anthem or take their hats off that they are more respectful? I leave that to you to decide. You know, go to a ball game when everybody is singing the national anthem and taking off their hats. You know, they may be more respectful, they may not be. Um, but then you ask yourself, well, you know, if it doesn't work, what else does it do? And you think about what else it does. I mean, does it bring about, in some countries, singing a national anthem brings about a kind of jingoistic attitude. You know, are we teaching kids something about a military way of thinking that we really don't necessarily need to do, but, but these are acts of military. Um, these are also acts that particularly come from a northern European Christian background. So if we talk about inclusion, if we talk about having diverse students and diverse schools, then why are we relegated to one way of thinking? Why are we looking at the values of only one group? You can get two-year-olds to talk about what they think is reasonable, why they think it's reasonable or, or unreasonable. If we don't do that, then we're going to, to be seeking to get nothing but obedient kids. Now, I understand how wonderful it is to have obedient kids. I don't have ever any experience with it, but, um, but it's, you know, the, the idea is out there, you know. <laughs> um, but I think that our schools are lazy. I think many of our parents are lazy. I think we just want to say, oh, for goodness sakes, let, let's just do what we can do, you know, get this over with, and just, you know, can, can you just not make a fuss? It takes a lot of work to be a teacher. Being a teacher is a very difficult thing to be, and if you're, especially if you're doing it right, you know, especially if you're putting in the energy and the time that it takes to engage students, that it takes to get them to think hard. So, you know, people have said, well, you can't let them say anything they want because, you know, there's a lot of hatred out there. Um, so what is that? You know, what is hate? And good luck defining that one, because there are so many different views on what is hate that even if you look at the uh, the criminal code in Canada that that you know talks about hate speech and and, you, and uses words like calumny, um, you know. It, in fact, what it does, is, as Alan Borvo used to say, is give you a whole string of synonyms for hate, but it doesn't actually tell you when you are uh, going beyond the pale. So. Can we talk to kids about what you can do instead? You know, if you hear something that is really disturbing, um, first of all, you ask yourself, why is that disturbing to me? You might have a really good reason. It may be that what is very disturbing to you is something that is perfectly dreadful. But you aren't relegated to just sitting in the back and saying, wow, that's awful. That is just terrible. I, I you know, I want to call somebody to deal with it. Well, you know, 
there are um, interesting things that happen. I, I remember a teacher many, many years ago, or somebody was a teacher candidate, saying that she really didn't like the people at Young and Dundas, we're not very far from there, who say all sorts of things to you as, as you walk on by. She said that she didn't think it should be against the law, but she did want the police to arrest people for doing it. So, <laughs> you know, you, you really, you can't make this stuff up, right? <laughs> But then there are places like London, Ontario, which my friend Kelly has pointed out, out to me, where the, uh, the city has come up with a bylaw which will make a very vague uh, description of, of nasty speech uh, illegal. It will be, a, uh, you know, it will become a, a, a fine, you, a fi you will be fined or possibly um, worse for, for saying things that are unpleasant. Now, in the book that I wrote earlier, I, you know, I foresaw this. Uh, <laughs> I had this little character called Mayor Mo, and he didn't like people saying nasty things. And so he created a bylaw that his city passed, and you know, it was the Be Nice bylaw. Um, that would be really nice. But in the real world, how are you going to oppose hatred, specifically, if you have to be nice? I don't want to walk by those guys who are saying awful things to women, for example, and say, you know, well, that's, you know, I don't, no, I want to set up on the opposite street corner and I want to teach kids how to set up on the opposite street corner so that they can understand that, uh, you know, what you have to say is not okay with me and it's not okay with large numbers of people passing by. I'm not going to stop you saying it because I know that stopping you from saying it is not stopping you from thinking it. And we need to be able to deal with what is really going on. And that is why banning hate speech is so dangerous. It goes underground, it doesn't go away. It can flourish in the darkness like mushrooms, and then it will come up again, and perhaps in more violent ways. So we need to get kids to deal with it right away. How do you deal with bullying? You know. Well, sometimes you need allies, like adults, if you're a kid. And sometimes you need you know, a few hundred of your closest friends. But we can learn to deal with things that we don't like without resorting to censorship and, and to banning. Um, sometimes people feel a very strong need to, to oppose the kind of speech that they find objectionable. And that's not a bad thing, but it can be pretty exhausting. I mean, even Borovoy used to say, if you do it often enough, you'll get a, have a stomach ache and get pimples. But um, you know, you have to be able to give yourself some leeway. You have to be able to say, OK, today, this is what I'm going to do. It's not going to fix things overnight. And maybe tomorrow I'll take the day off. And then I'm going to come back and do it again, because you can't allow yourself to just be absolutely exhausted. When I talk about kids in schools, I'm also talking about a curriculum. And one of the questions that, as adults, I think we need to ask ourselves is, who chooses what's on a curriculum? Because we know that whatever is on a curriculum, there's lots of stuff that isn't. And why isn't it there? So, you know, for, for groups of people who felt that they have not been included in curricula over, over the years, um, we need to hear from them. Like the little boy who wouldn't stand for the national anthem because he said, this curriculum doesn't reflect my reality and my family. But what if you're finding stuff that is there and you have no reason to want it there? You think that that book which you're learning in school is really a terrible book, that it uh, is stereotyping a certain group of people, or that it's just really badly written. Should, as a child, you be allowed to say, you know what, um, I really would like to be able to stand up and tell you why this book is not appropriate for my grade, for me. Um, should I stop other people from reading it? It's a question that kids should be learning to deal with. You don't like that book. You tell us what's wrong with it. Let's talk about it. And I think let's talk about it is an answer to a lot of the kinds of conundra that, that we find. They, these things are, are difficult. Because one of the things that we know about curricula is they're political. 
you know, whichever party is in power, um, they are the ones who will be developing the next curriculum. Uh, we've seen this in Ontario around the sex education curriculum and, you know, trying to get people to uh, support a curriculum different from the one of the previous party. Uh, is that good for kids? Um, is it good for anybody? I mean, should we really be asking kids to look at their curriculum in a critical fashion. Can you start that fairly early on? Can you ask kids, you know, what do you think about this book we're teaching you? Do you think that it's a good book to learn from? And if it is, tell me why. If it isn't, tell me why not. And does the kid sitting next to you agree with you? And if not, wonderful. Let's have a, a real conversation about what is going on with this. Um, there's a, a word that I think Kara and I will be talking about uh, in, in, in a bit that I'm sure we've all uh, heard uh, in various uh, guises, and that word is unsafe. Um, people have said, you know, I can't talk about that. It makes me feel unsafe. And I remember um, a number of years ago, I was uh, at a faculty of education, and there were two women who were both uh, teacher candidates in, in the faculty of education. And uh, they were very angry at one another. Um, one woman was lesbian, and she said that the other woman, who was a very devout Christian, was saying things that made her feel unsafe. That the, the religious woman, her, her view of the right way to live was so different from her view of the right way to live, she felt unsafe. And she really wanted the religious woman to be excluded from the class. She didn't think she belonged in a class of people who were becoming teachers. And I thought this was a really interesting opportunity to talk about what we mean when we say unsafe. So the class, you know, I kind of instigated a bit of a discussion. You know, do you feel physically threatened? You know, do you feel that something bad is going to happen to you? Well, the woman who felt threatened did not feel threatened by the other woman in the sense that, that she felt she was going to be physically harmed. So are you saying that you feel, and, and others were, were, were playing with this idea. I wasn't pointing anyone out, but I was asking them to see if they could define unsafe uh, in, their, in their own view. So it, it turned out that a lot of people felt unsafe when someone disagreed with them. I don't like hearing somebody whose point of view is so different from mine that it makes me feel shaky on my own ground. You know, I'm not sure exactly what I believe. I know I don't believe what you believe, but when you tell me what you believe, now I'm really feeling unsafe because I'm kind of confused, actually. So is there a way that teachers can take that kind of expression and turn it into a lively, critical discussion without telling one or the other person that they don't belong in the class, that they must shut up, and that their viewpoint is unacceptable. Uh, I think we can do it. Um, I think it's difficult, as I said. I think this is what teachers need to do. It's difficult, but I think we can do it. I, um, this, this book has quizzes in it, and I think I'll end just by leaving open the, the answers just to see what people think ab about the quizzes. So here's a quest the question in, in this quiz. There are, there are 10 short questions. Is this censorship or is it not censorship? Censorship is the opposite of freedom of expression. If rules keep us from expressing our views without a good reason, that could be unfair. But sometimes we need to know when or where to express ourselves. It's not just good manners. So is this censorship or not? Your mother tells you to turn your music down. It's too loud for her. Censorship? No. Your school has a new rule. Nothing can be posted on the student bulletin board without the principal's prior approval. Read the wall. You're caught writing Black Lives Matter in the washroom. The teacher makes you wash the graffiti off the wall. Are you being censored? The principal announces that the school Christmas concert will now be called the winter concert, and it will take place in January. <laughs> Censorship? 
You and your family are celebrating Cinco de Mayo with music, dancing, and great food. You ask your next door neighbor to come join the party, but he tells you to go away. He thinks Mexican festivals don't belong in this country. This one's called Hip Hop Cop. You and your friends are dancing to hip hop in a public park. A police officer says the words to your song are offensive. She says she will arrest you if you don't stop. Video no-no. In the public library, you notice that the man at the next computer has a sex video on his screen. When you report it to the librarian, she tells the man to leave. Is he being censored? Hate the hate. The word terrorist is sprayed on a mosque, a Muslim house of worship. Down the street, the police arrest a person holding a can of spray paint. And this one, which has happened in some schools, a public school's librarian decides to remove all books by gay authors. Remember, it's a school library. And we've also had this one. <laughs> the local church wants to distribute Bibles to all the kids in your school. Your principal says they cannot use the school for this purpose. These aren't easy, are they? <laughs> you can see some of them are obvious, some of them not so obvious, and some of them just need a good long discussion. So I'm going to leave you with those. There are answers uh, in the book. You can freely disagree with, with the answers, but I'm going to ask my friend Kara if we can have a chat about what's been going on and uh, where we go. <laughs> so um, thank you to the Center for Free Expression for hosting this event and for having me here to talk about this wonderful book. Um, I know that usually with these kinds of things, there's supposed to be like some conflict and debate, but I'm not <laughs> sure we're going to get into that. Um, but, but I have a couple of things that I sort of want to comment on, and maybe we can talk about them a little bit together. Um, so I work at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, and part of my job involves going into schools sometimes and talking to students about their rights and freedoms and doing what Danielle mentioned, talking about Section 1 of the Charter and how... Um, how students can figure out whether you know, limits that are placed on their rights are reasonable in their view. So we don't try to um, tell them what the civil libertarian view is on, on a particular um, limit on their rights. We try to get them to, to figure out what they think for themselves. Um, and I find that talking about freedom of expression with young people is the most challenging um, because uh, it, it seems a bit abstract to them, um, and they're in an environment in school where, um, especially in the last, I don't know, probably decade or so, there's a lot of emphasis on anti-bullying, um, which, uh, not that I'm uh, a promoter of bullies, <laughs> but there, there is, you know, the, the anti-bullying um, rhetoric and movement is a movement that does limit free speech. And um, so students are, are growing up in that environment and they, um, you know, when we talk about limits on free expression, I'll say, you know, can you say whatever you want? And they'll say, no, you, you know, you can't say hateful things. Um, and their idea of what constitutes hate speech is very different from what the law actually defines as hate speech, right? There's a Really, even though we have criminal laws in Canada that limit hate speech, it's a pretty narrow and extreme kind of stuff, not, not stuff that the average person is usually kind of exposed to. Um, and just saying that you hate a particular group, that's actually not hate speech under the law. So that's something that... It's rude. Yeah, it's rude. <laughs> and that's, that's, I mean, one of the things that I think the book does really well is... Um, it encourages that critical thinking that, that we try to do in, in the workshops when we go to uh, the CCLAT, the workshops that were developed by Danielle. Um, but it also, it, it also sort of gives them some good common sense advice about really just the, you know, if you don't have something nice to say, you don't always have to say it. Um, and that it's okay to, you know, that you may have views that you know other people um, will find offensive and hurtful. And, 
take a beat and think about the implications of, of saying those things. Not that you can't say them, not that you should be punished for saying them, but, but to think about it. Um, and I, I think it's, it's the, the part that I find hard to explain to students is the difference between the kind of interpersonal uh, interactions that we have with people where we can decide, I'm not going to listen to this person, or I'm going to unfollow this person on you know, Twitter, or I'm going to block this person from contacting me, and the government, uh, the government impact and the government um, intrusion on what you can and can't say. And I think for young people today, the, the fact that they're really growing up online makes it a lot more complicated. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's right. And and I also I think that when you look at sort of the giant companies like Google and um, you know the the the, the, the ones that run all Facebook, yeah. you know, all of this stuff they're quasi governmental mm -hmm. and when they say you can't use this kind of language or you you know you'll be blocked if you say something or um, you know or faith goldie is never going to appear yeah. again on <laughs> facebook um, you know I, I i'm no fan of faith goldie but i'm really worried that if they block faith goldie who else is are, are they are they going to block next um, you know she's she, she's not pleasant mm -hmm. but I want to know what she has to say because if she's coming into my neighborhood, I want to be able to well, argue. She has her own website, so you don't. Yeah, have to, I don't have to worry about. Her. Thank you. <laughs> I don't want to be caught looking at it. <laughs> but but you know, I think <laughs> that that, that question around um, whether these private platforms, um, you know, whether their terms of service and their decisions. Um, I'm not inclined to treat them as government right now, but I can I can see that, um, and there's even now. I mean, there's a lot of pressure by government to um, to get social media companies to to do more of this, right? They were they you know they there's no law that says they have to remove this kind of stuff, but they've strongly encouraged it and they've applauded them when they've made the, those decisions. And the next step, and the step that, that has happened in, in some European countries, is to say, if you don't get this stuff off your platform, you're going to be facing serious fines, which is just a way of, it's, it's censorship by proxy, yes. really. So I think that's kind of the next like, frontier. Um, and I think that for students, the, the fact that um, I mean, they've sort of always had a platform, um, which is not something like when I was 12, I didn't have a way of communicating with the entire world. Now, I think that was probably a good thing. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure it's a good thing that 12 year olds today have a way of communicating with Especially if the they're posting world. things like, who's the ugliest kid in your class? Right, right. right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you may not have the best judgment at that stage, and you may regret it later on. And and the internet is is forever, really. Yeah. Um, doesn't, doesn't so I win. think even though it has this great sort of democratizing effect because everyone gets a platform, um, it it also means that everyone gets a platform, yeah. <laughs> um, and and it means that um, you know the other thing about the internet that that is different than sort of classic free speech stuff is the anonymity um, and the protection that that provides and the fact that people are often a lot more willing to say horrible things. Yeah, horrible things if, they, um, if they're not going to be held accountable for it. Um, so I think that that also makes it harder to, to talk to students about some of this stuff. Um, and then finally, and I, I don't know if this has sort of infected, um, I'm curious to know whether you think this, this has infected the younger um, grades or whether this is more of a high school university um, issue. But there, there are these sort of narratives now around free speech. There's the narrative that says that advocates for free speech are really just hateful people who want to use freedom of expression as a way to allow, give them the permission to espouse their hateful views. Um, there's the safe space narrative, which is that you know anything that's um, offensive to me is harmful and has to be shut down. And then there's the response to that, which is 
the, the safe space people are, you know, fragile snowflakes who, uh, who are, are sensors yeah. effectively. Now, I don't know if that kind of narrative is I think it has, in other guises, mm -hmm. I, I, I think it is. You know, it, it's, it, younger kids aren't using that kind yeah. of, of, <laughs> of language. But I, I think that, you know, I can say anything I want, no, you can't, is, more, is, right. is, is basically yeah. the level of, of that kind of, you know, and, and I'm going to tell, not only am I going to tell the teacher or my mom, I'm going to tell Greater North America <laughs> um, what you said, and I'm going to make sure that you're really, really shamed for saying it. And yeah. I think the shaming yeah. um, that, is, that is going on is a really problematic thing. I think that, you know, that kids, you know, again, I'm, I'm back to, you know, teaching manners is, is not something we, we can fail to do. Mm -hmm. I think if, if we're going to be strongly in support of freedom of expression, I think it behooves us to teach our kids uh, carefully about what some of the effects are of, of using your, your speech. Mm -hmm. Not to say that you don't do it, but understand that what you say could make you look like an idiot. Um, it could also really hurt somebody's feelings. I think that you know, people, younger people, are beginning to understand, um, you know, bullying and suicide as having a, uh, you know, a close connection mm -hmm. in many in many cases. And I, th I think that it is particularly important for teachers uh, to be talking to kids about this instead of saying you don't get to say that because they're going to say it. Um, but it's just, you know, be aware of what kind of medium you're using mm -hmm. and how that, that is, is going to go, go out yeah. there. But I, I, I think you're right. I think that the, the, even the expression, freedom of expression, has become the purview of the right wing. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, people are saying, well, you know, the, the expression that I've heard, and I don't quite know where to go with this, when people say that's not free speech, it's hate speech. Yeah. Well, I don't understand <laughs> what that even means, you know. Yeah, it's free speech and it's really nasty. Right. Yeah. No, I've I've had that as well where what free speech doesn't include hate speech. And I mean, I guess like as a lawyer I look at that and think, well, well okay, so the, the Supreme Court has said that it's reasonable to restrict hate speech, but I don't think that's what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, no. Um, because again, it's a, it's a pretty narrow you know, a band of, of, of speech that we're talking about. And that's too easy, too, right? That, that's just, it's, it, again, it's lazy. Yeah. You know, if, if, if you say to, to kids, you have free speech, but you don't get to, you know, to say anything negative about any group, mm -hmm. um, I always like to say, well, you know, if I'm not allowed to say anything negative about any group, how am I going to fight racism? Mm -hmm. You know, because that group of Nazi skinhead youth, <laughs> I really want to say awful things right. about them, and I'm going to, so get ready. Right. right, I remember Alan used to give the example of this book, um, this book called Hitler's Willing Executioners, which was all about the role that ordinary Germans played in, in the Holocaust. And, you know, he said, well, if you read that book, it might inspire you to hate the German people. So is that a book that is hate speech? Does that mean that that book is? And, and, and I've tried sometimes with students to talk about how, um, you know, the same freedom of expression that protects the preacher on the corner who's saying homophobic things um, was what allowed the LGBTQ community to get the rights that they have. So we, you know, you, we sort of have to realize kind of the, the broader implications. The other thing I want to talk about, though, about the book um, is that um, the thing that I really like that it does is it has sort of these three uh, archetypes of of people, the um, the censor, right, the person who um, really doesn't want to hear anything that doesn't accord with their own beliefs. And there's there's one of the the quizzes is sort of a list of of things, and it's a true false, and it's it's a long list. And at the end, it sort of says if you said true to a lot of these things, it's sort of like maybe go back and check yourself a little bit <laughs> and think about it. Because they're really like, you know, like only the movies that I like. Like you shouldn't be allowed to show movies that say this. You shouldn't be allowed to do this. So they're, they're, they're sort of, you know, getting, I think, the reader to think about where they position themselves. The other 
archetype is the um, the speech maker, the person who is, you know, wants to share their opinion, um, and and it 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 again sort of provides a bunch of different scenarios where um, the students are sort of encouraged to think about, you know, what would I do in this situation, um, and and then there's the the witness, um, and this is where I think it's it's. Um, because, I mean, I know Danielle personally, and I know she's a fierce advocate, um, and I know that she probably doesn't let a lot of stuff slide. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at her granddaughter. Um, but, but one of the things that I think it's really important to do in a book that's for kids is, is to do that part about how it's, it's good to speak up but it's not always your job. It's not always your responsibility. Sometimes it's not gonna be safe for you to do it. And I mean safe in the- In the physical, physical sense, sense, yeah. Of the term. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's just gonna be really uncomfortable in a way that you, you don't have to put yourself in that position to do. And I think it's kind of, you know, I feel like that's not permission you would normally give to yourself, but I think it's nice that you've given it. Well, to they're kids. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think that, you know, you, you have to live to fight another day, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and also, there's, there's some issues that are really important to certain kids and not to other kids. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some issues that, that, you know, maybe should be taken on by the adults in their lives because they're just too complex mm -hmm or too dangerous yeah. for, for kids themselves to, to encounter. I think that, that you, you know, you have to always use a bit of judgment, mm -hmm. you know, and, and also a bit of humor, like, oh, yeah. you know, this can get really tiring. Yeah, yeah, there is some yeah. discussion about how, you know, sometimes it, the most effective thing is to just point out how absurd someone is, you know, being. And I, I, we've talked a lot in the office about, um, uh, because it can be, um, it's not fun to be a free speech advocate, frankly. Uh, the Especially people... when you stand up for people who are really creepy. Yeah. And there's a lot of that around, you <laughs> yeah, know. You know I mean, the... you don't usually have to stand up for people who are saying nice stuff. No. Nobody, nobody's objecting. If you're fighting for free speech, you're standing up for Ernst Zundel. Yeah. You know, yeah, my, or, or, you my know. parents love it when I tell them that, you know, it's the Holocaust denier and the child pornographer. That those are the cases that I'm working on right now, and 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 so like I think it can be really, really difficult. And so we we try sometimes to talk about how um, counter speech is the better way of doing things, and there are some really good um, comical examples of counter speech. Like I don't know if you've ever seen these. Um, uh, I think they're in the UK. There's a couple that goes to these anti-abortion protests and they hold up these signs that say things like weird hobby or, uh, you know, just with a sign pointing like, like this is a strange thing to do on a Saturday. Um, um, and there was that, I think it's in a town in Germany um, where they, there's a, like a, basically a neo-Nazi rally um, that runs through this neighborhood, and the town decided to, like, turn it into a fundraiser. It was like called their their most um, involuntary walkathon, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> where, where they got people to donate money um, to you know to organizations that that fight against. Um, Racism and yes, and the, 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 and it was was it more money for the least distance or yeah, something yeah, like that. Like it, so yeah, there's really it creative. Was, it, there's so many creative, creative people out do. there. Yeah, and and it's it's funny. Yeah, you know that I, I, and I think it's the humor that really that really takes you further. Yeah. than than the sweat of the brow. Yeah, and I think you know teaching young people about speaking up and and. Um, you know, and, and how to gauge when the right time for that is. I think that's, that's something that's hard to do, but I really, I genuinely do think the book does a really great job oh, of that. So I know this isn't like a, <laughs> a big combative debate, well, but. You know, <laughs> well, one, of, one of the things that I was asked to do in the book was to come up with, um, did you know, little tiny factoids. And oh, I if, liked I those, They're kind of funny, but if you look at things that have been censored over time, yeah. I mean, did you know it was, 
um, against the the uh, television and radio regulations to say the word pregnant on uh, on, <laughs> on, te on television right through the 19, 1950s. It, it started with Lucille Ball. She was pregnant. Mm. Only they weren't allowed to say that. <laughs> they had to say she was with child or expecting, but they couldn't say pregnant. You know, I mean, they, these things, when you think about them yeah. now, are so ludicrous. Th there's one about how Tweety Bird was initially pink, pink. but people thought that he looked naked. So they, <laughs> 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 so they changed it to yellow. That's right. They had to change the, yeah. yeah. The, yeah. There's, yeah. there's a good bit of fun. Yeah. <laughs> there was, there was a, a, a volume of Where's Waldo that was banned. Now, yeah. I don't know if any, and most of you have probably seen the Where's Waldo books, but there's one where there's this massive beach scene, and there's a a woman with one breast showing, and they banned the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, yeah, a cartoon, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what, right, uh, a lot of the stuff around social media and Facebook is, you know, is is women breastfeeding. That gets taken down a lot because there's nipples, and, <laughs> and you can't show that. <laughs> um, I mean, Babies. that is the, the private censorship, but yeah. it's um, spurred a lot of those discussions. So. Um, I know that this is, uh, I think, you know, going to be a valuable tool for, for us to use at sc in schools. Um, and I do want to make a little plug for, um, for the CCLA um, and the CCLET. And um, uh, some portion of the funds raised tonight will go to the organization, which is a, a nonprofit that um, doesn't accept government funds, so um, we rely on private donations. Um, there's also a little sheet at the back. We did this for um, an event that I spoke at a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was invited to a talk, and this will give you a sense of, um, of where things are at, even um, at the university level. I was invited to a talk at U of T um, because there are um, I guess there are some anti-abortion protesters who are regularly on campus, and some students are really uncomfortable with it. And they've talked about, they've started a petition and talked about creating some bubble zones on the campus where, um, where free speech doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> um, and, um, and, you know, the, this discussion that we had was really, um, Interesting because we talked about the there is bubble zone legislation in Ontario um, for around abortion clinics, um, and one of the questions that they asked was, you know, what are the lessons we can learn from that that can be transported to the post-secondary environment? And the answer is none. Right? There is <laughs> nothing remotely similar about a university compared to an abortion clinic. There. The reasons why you might prohibit people from being at a certain distance are to allow access and, you know, and, and the fact that people are going to obtain a, a legal service. Um, those, just, those considerations just don't apply. And so we wanted to think of a way to encourage people to engage in counter speech. Um, so we, we printed up these little things. And they, they, on one side, just say, CCLA believes in your right to free speech. And on the other side, they say, I think, and you can write in what you think. And I, I had suggested that you might want to hand this to someone and say, I think you're an asshole. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's me exercising my free speech. Yep. <laughs> um, but I figure we're at a free speech event. I Absolutely. Can, I can throw a curse word out there. <laughs> um, so I, I, don't know, I don't know if there's, I don't know if we're taking questions yeah. or. So we're going to do questions. Uh, this this session is all being recorded. It's going to be podcast on the website tomorrow or the next day. So, Ange has my phone. If you'd like to ask a question, make a comment, I just ask you to keep it short. Just put up your hand and we'll recognize you and Ange will bring you the mic. Anybody want to join the conversation? Make a comment. Hi, my name's uh, Mark. Um, and um, Kara, you were talking earlier about, um, gosh, I hope I remember the specifics, um, about uh, sometimes you don't have to, like, you have the right, but it isn't always necessary and mm -hmm. necessarily a good idea. And I'm not sure that I have a question, but I want to just mention something to to kind of reinforce that. Um, I'm, I'm a gay man, and I grew up with few to no role models. <clears throat> and so my fear of, and, and, and not sharing who I was was at, 
personal risk in my immediate circle. But today I look out and I see that there is an openly gay man running for US president, and I sort of think to myself, he probably had to have a conversation with his husband about the fact that he could very likely be assassinated, and what does that mean? It, the, 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 the stakes are so much higher, and um, I love the fact that you uh, are focusing on something like this for, the, for kids, because um, it's so easy for us to, to uh, get lost in, in, you know, what are the extremes around what are my rights to free speech, and where, where do I not have a right, and should I? And are there places where I should just keep my mouth shut for my own safety and other people's safety? Um, I don't know how I would have felt, you know, growing up with Pete Buttigieg actually trying for president mm. and the absolute reality that this could actually turn out to be something horrible, you know? And, and so I'm not sure how that would have felt for, for me as a kid. And I, you know, I worry about the kids today growing up and all the stuff that is it's just so, so stressful and the tension and all. So it's not really a question, but no, I but 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 you know, it it, it reminds me of um, something that people have said as a way of controlling speech too, and people have said things like, you know, you better be careful of what you say because you could get hurt. And I remember um, that people said to neo Nazis, they said, we've got to protect them from people who will gang up against them. Therefore, we have to prevent them from speaking for their own good. And I think you can see how this can turn around. So, you know, if people say, well, you know, you have to be really careful about what you say because people could react against you in a, in a violent fashion. It's already against the law to hurt people. You know, it doesn't matter what, what the reason is. You can't do that. You don't get to hurt people. So, you know, I, I think that we need to push that part aside. And we say, free speech in general, we're, go we're going to support the free speech. We are never going to support somebody's right to harm another person, no matter what, you know, whether it's because they're gay or because they're a communist or because they're Jewish or because they're wearing a blue sweater, you know, whatever it is, we're not going to allow that to happen. In the real world, stuff happens, but I, I think that we have to make sure that we, we make a firm distinction in, in that area. Uh, thank you. I have a question. Uh, what we've seen a lot in the past couple of years is that the free speech has been become the the new bandwagon of a group of of public intellectuals who have captured the attention of people, and they're using it to fight against what they consider to be anything that is against a more traditional way of life. So for example, you have people who are saying, we don't need this advocacy for, um, for equality for, for LG, LGBTQ people. We don't need this advocacy for the, for the, uh, for the, for the uh, equality of men and women. We don't need the advocacy for uh, all these things like religions, et cetera. We don't need to have this because effectively, we need free speech in order to stand up and say, that we have the right to fight for this tra these traditional values. And you're hearing this all the time. How do you address that with children? Because when you're get telling them that they have the right for it to, to have free speech, how do you also get them to realize that it can, it can work both ways and it can become a, a really difficult situation when you've got people who are advocating shutting down people who are, shouting, who, are, who are shouting against the ones who are trying to say, we don't need all this nice stuff anymore. We don't, we don't need this at all. And they're calling that free speech. It's a tough one. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that it's, I mean, it, it's hard, I think, to figure out where, and I, and I don't know how you do it effectively with young people, except to, except to give some examples of the, the kinds of things that, you know, so sometimes um, I'll talk about, you know, when the Nazis marched in Skokie and, um, you know, some of the arguments against allowing that, that had to happen and against the, the ACLU standing up for, for their right to do that, you know, is to say, well, they chose this area because it had, you know, a lot of Holocaust survivors. And why couldn't it just be a place where, you know, people wouldn't have been as uncomfortable and as, you know, felt as in danger. 
Um, and then I think about you know Martin Luther King in Selma, and and how that same argument could be made. Well, why march? Why have a civil rights march through you know a place where white people don't like black people? I mean, it would just make them feel unsafe. And and so I think you sometimes have to use the examples. But I think that um, the question about when you know when is when free speech is used to kind of shut down other other free speech. That's a really difficult one, and and there's there's some cases that that we've been looking at and thinking about. There's a, a case in Alberta actually where um, uh, some students were um, some students on campus were they had one of these graphic anti-abortion displays, um, and some some other students on campus were really unhappy that this was being you know, permitted on campus. And so they did a counter protest, but their way of, of counter protesting was to sort of create a, a blockade so that you couldn't really see the display. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a hard question for me whether that is counter speech or whether that's, you know, uh, obliterating someone else's right to free speech. Um, I think, I, I think it's, it's probably not a problem to do something that lets people know what they're in for, um, to say, you know, there's some graphic stuff behind here. If you want to go see it, you can, but you should know what's there. Um, but creating something that doesn't allow anyone, you know, to see that at all, if they, if, if they choose to, you know, that is where I think that is a problem. But Teaching it to young people, I mean, I, I couldn't have written this book. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I do think it's a really hard thing to, to explain to young yeah, people. Yeah, and, and, and you're not always going to get it right either. I mean, because the, the, you want to encourage speech, you're going to end up with some stuff you yeah. really don't want. But the, the story that you, you mentioned in, in Alberta kind of reminds me of the, the death of Matthew Shepard, as I'd mentioned to you before. He was a young gay man who was murdered. Um, he was, uh, it, this is in the United States. And at his funeral, the Westboro Baptist Church came out as, in their inimitable fashion with signs uh, that were really ugly and, you know, the signs that the family had to see at, at, at the funeral. A group of people got together and made angel costumes huge wings and these huge wings surrounded the church where the funeral was held so that the family would not have to see the uh, ba the Westboro Baptist Church and their ugly anti-gay signs. A very moving and, and beautiful kind of counter speech yeah. but y we're still left with that question mm -hmm. did you know does do those I'm okay with that <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a friend of mine uh, who came out late in life, he and his daughter were driving by a military funeral in Kansas City, Missouri, mm -hmm. and the Westboro Baptist Church were protesting and had all those horrible signs. And he stopped the car and he told his daughter, he said, you look at what's happening here. There are people looking at this all over who are saying, who used to say, I'm not sure how I feel about this issue. Now they're looking at these horrible signs and saying, well, I certainly don't feel like that. Mm -hmm. And so... Fred Phelps and his people, in many instances, have actually done a lot for the LGBTQ plus, <laughs> and I'm very grateful. Well, for that. and of course, there, uh, there, and of course, you know that across the road or or next door to the Westboro Baptist Church, uh, a, a, an LGBTQ organization bought the building and covered it with rainbows. <laughs> so, you know, I think there there are always going to be clever people finding ways to use to use counter speech, and I. Think I think encouraging kids to come up with funny ways of embarrassing people who say terrible things, it, not embarrassing them personally, but embarrassing them, but you know, it, showing how ludicrous the expression is, it, it is, a, is a great way, you know, and getting, getting kids to come up, kids are endlessly creative, you know, they will find ways to, to show how foolish that kind of expression is. And I, I, yeah, no, I know. I mean, I know I was, I know everyone laughed when I said I'm okay with that, but the, <laughs> the reason I, there is actually a principal reason why. I'm I know okay there with is, Kara. Uh, <laughs> and that's because the right to freedom of expression doesn't include the right to a captive audience. So I don't think that people at a funeral have to be um, 
faced with that. And I think it's a fair assumption on the part of the counter protesters that no one attending that funeral wanted to see that expression. On a university campus, that's a different question. And so, you know, there are, there have been, there have been instances where they've said, look, you can put that display on if you want, but but basically you have to put it in a room where no one can see it. In the dark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's a problem. <laughs> um, at the same, by the same token, there should be a way to avoid it if you want to, right? It, it shouldn't be that you're forced to, to see that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. That's my principal <laughs> basis for... <laughs> you Hi, I guess I have a technical question then. Um, I don't understand why we're talking about sort of private citizens and other private citizens. Why there's any speech stuff involved at all? Like, for example, if someone, if I have a viewpoint and I go down the street and I put posters up on the lamp posts, right? And you don't agree with my viewpoint, so you go over and over poster my poster. That's just that's the marketplace. It's the of free ideas. market, right? Yeah. Free market of ideas, right? Mm -hmm. And so the the, the 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 examples we just talked about, I sort of see in that category. There's no, there's no government. There's no you know university which is funded by governments who are doing any censorship at all. It's just people. Or if I if I say I have I have a viewpoint, and one of the ways I want to make my viewpoint is by finding ways to silence other people, who have an opposing viewpoint, right? And I'm not breaking any laws. I'm not talking about like. You know, not beating them up. Not beating them up and not breaking the laws like, you know, like destroying the internet connection or anything like that. But I'm just finding legal ways to, to, to silence their voice. Then I kind of see this completely different from freedom of expression, right? Is, is that true or is that not true? So, I mean, I, I think to a point, I, I think actually on the, on the, in the campus context, it, it is different because, and partly um, it's different in Ontario now because the government has required that universities adopt free speech codes and um, those free speech codes have to say certain things in the spirit of free speech. There's a mandatory element to the <laughs> free speech code and, and they have to include things around um, allowing for freedom of expression on campus um, and not allowing people to, to, to block that kind of expression. So, so in this Alberta case, actually, one of the issues that went to court was um, it, it went to court in part because both groups of students complained about each other. Um, neither one was disciplined. And one of the groups complained about the fact that one of the groups wasn't disciplined, that they had violated the code of conduct, right? Universities have these codes of conduct. So there is that element, whether it's government or a bit far removed from government, but still government. Um, the other reason that it, it got raised was because um, as a result of the, the counter protests and what happened, the school said the next year when the anti-abortion group applied to have their display, the school said, well, we're going to, and this is something that the Center for Free Expression has worked on, we're going to have to, you're going to have to pay around $17,000 to cover the costs of security that will be required, right? So, um, and this actually happens in, in a more direct government context where you might say, you know, we want to have a rally on this day and a city will say, okay, well, you know, given what you're doing and the kind of controversy that it might bring uh, and the fact that people might come out and, and argue about it, um, you know, we're going to require you to get a $2 million insurance policy and 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 so there are ways to kind of um, you know restrict or make it much harder for people to express themselves with those kinds of things but I I think you're right like the 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 way that it arises with something like the funerals is is that you know I mean if if that was a funeral for one of my family members I would say why aren't the police arresting these people because like they're this is disrupting a funeral, a funeral. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so, so there, like, there can be ways that some of those things do implicate the state. And but, um, but, but you're right. And actually, it does. It, it's one of the things that I find hard in talking to students about, you know, when it's just sort of the interpersonal 
conflict or debate about issues and when there's a... But when you're talking about kids, often it's the school who's the actor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is, that is an arm of government. Um, but I think that when you talk to kids about not clamping down on one another, it's kind of practice. You know, see if you can deal with this issue without shutting somebody up permanently. You know, can, can, and I think that that's something that kids really need to learn, that they can't have the expectation that they will never hear anything they don't like hearing. Um, you know, you don't have the right to be free from being offended. That's, that's not a right that it, it, we, we can even re remotely think to protect. So I, I think that, you know, it's something we need kids to understand at an early age, even amongst interpersonal things, although quite rightly that isn't what freedom of expression is about, that's for sure. Could I make it just a little more difficult, uh, this discussion? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> so you gave your example. I mean, for the most part, our courts have, re have taken the view that the charter does not apply to universities. So under your view, if a group was having an event and other people were upset about it, they could come in and block the entrance, shut off the loudspeaker system, turn off the lights. And many of us have found that deeply offensive in a university. So partly the context is not only does the charter apply, but also what's the purpose of the organization? The purpose of the university is to encourage debate, discussion, analysis, um, and therefore even though the charter doesn't restrict it, the context is one where whoever has the biggest crowd doesn't get to dictate what can be heard. And that really is the logic behind, you know, if people can just tear down posters, then people who are marginalized and raising socially unpopular views can just have a mass movement tearing things down. And we've seen where that's gone in some countries, as in Germany in the 30s. So it, it gets really tricky as to how we address that. I don't know if you have comments, but. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I, I agree. And I think, I mean, the, the point about it being practice, I think is, um, that, that makes sense to me that, you know, that one of the reasons that we might use some of these examples, especially with young people, is because they're the kinds of things that they may be, you know, more likely to be confronted with. Um, but um, and and it sort of provides them with that opportunity to see that you don't necessarily have to silence someone in order to respond to them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. t-shirts are a great example. T-shirts are often a, an issue in schools. You know, kids who don't have a uniform requirement wear t-shirts that say stuff on them. And almost every t-shirt insults somebody. <laughs> um, you know, like there's, there, there's, do you remember Fluffy Bunny? Fluffy Bunny t-shirts that said, boys are stupid, throw rocks at them. <laughs> um, you know, and, and that one was forbidden, right? Um, or the ones that say, uh, girls rule, boys drool. Remember mm. that one? Um, you know, but then, then there were t-shirts that said things like, a life without Jesus is not worth living. Uh, and that was a, the, you know, that, that was a t-shirt that became an issue in, in a school. These things haven't got to court in Canada, no. sadly, because you know we don't have a tinker case. But I mean, there was another one that that, that said, "Got land, thank an Indian," um, you know. And there was a girl who was disciplined for that. These things were worked out within the context of families and schools. But um, you know, if we were in the states, it probably would have got to court, yeah. and it would have been the ACLU <laughs> fighting for the right of the kid to wear the T-shirt that that other people found offensive or shocking or, or, or something like that. We've had students who've contacted us for, um, we've had the student with, with the, you know, the national anthem. Yeah. Um, and we've had students, a few years ago, we had a student who, um, he was given an award at a, an athletic assembly or rally. And um, when he accepted the award, he made a speech about how uh, basically, it was really unfair the way the soccer team was treated at the school. The they football team a, yeah. always got the good practice time. The soccer team had to go somewhere else. Um, and he was disciplined um, for making that speech. And, and he contacted us. And, and he, I mean, he was a, a very um, resourceful kid um, and managed to get like a rally at the school. And eventually, the school backed down. And, I think because we're Canadians and we like to be nice to each other, <laughs> usually someone sort of backs down. But um, but yeah, these issues come up. And yeah, the the t-shirts, the um, the t-shirt is a good example that 
life without Jesus is wasted. So um, I read a bit about this this case. Uh, I think it was in, in Nova Scotia. Yeah, in Nova yeah. Scotia, maybe. Um, and and so he was suspended. The kid that wore this T-shirt, and apparently it wasn't like he wore it. He wore it every day um, to school. Must have been smelly. Yeah, <laughs> or maybe he had many, many versions of it. Um, and I think they actually suggested an edit to him. They said, if your shirt said, my life without Jesus is wasted, that would be okay. But the shirt as it stands right now is suggesting to other people that there's something wrong with the way they live. Anyway, there was a lot of media coverage, and the school kind of looked stupid for doing this. And, and so they backed down. And um, when the kid came back to school, they decided to have an assembly where they would discuss sort of freedom of expression and how to you know, respectfully disagree with each other and have, have civil disagreements. Um, and the, the kid's father pulled him out of school because he said, I sent him there to learn English and math, not to have these lessons about freedom of expression. So sometimes it is exactly the ones that need it most that, that you, don't you get it. You can't make this stuff up, yeah. right? Yeah. It, it actually turned out that it wasn't just the t-shirt. Um, the students had been complaining about this kid because he was proselytizing to them on a regular basis. And, and they would repeatedly say, like, I'm not interested. Leave me alone. But he sort of didn't let up. Um, so, which I think, you know, it's a legitimate reason to take some action if that's happening. It's unfortunate that they pinned it all on the T-shirt because they, they came <laughs> off looking really stupid. <laughs> I learned from watching the Cheney movie that um, the U.S. Congress uh, put through legislation that allowed media to not have to be balanced, and that that gave rise to the birth of Fox News and other um, partisan media companies. So I guess my question to you is, to what extent this methodology you're proposing here really relies on a kind of balanced media system? Would it have worked in crystal knocked? Um, well, Kristallnacht was certainly an act of violence. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm talking about words and not acts here for sure. Um, you know, I don't think anything would have worked in <laughs> Kristallnacht. But I, I, I'm, I'm interested in the, the concept of balanced media because you, it's very difficult to say almost anything without a point of view. You know, because whatever, as I said about curricula, whatever you choose to put on a curriculum, there's other stuff that isn't there. So, you know, can you truly have a balanced curriculum? Can you have a balanced way of teaching? I don't think you can be all that balanced. I mean, I think Fox News is like <laughs> way on the other side of that question. That's another story altogether. But um, I would expect that teachers should, would be able to learn what their own points of view are um, and, and be mindful of it, that they should be able to seek out points of view that are different uh, in their class. So, I mean, you know how in Canada we speak about um, diversity being so important? I mean, John Stuart Mill talked about variety. That was the same word, but, you know, the, ver the version back then. We really need to hear from as many as we possibly can, as many different views, even the ones we don't like very much. And I think we have to get kids used to hearing stuff that is, is awful. I mean, I would, I would suggest, not little guys, but, you know, get older kids to listen to Fox News and to listen to PBS and to read the New York Times and to read the Washington Post and then put it together and, and find out what they think. You know, try it out. Not, not little guys. Little guys, but with little guys, you can use a lot of other kinds of media um, uh, to, to get them a little perturbed. You know, not desperate, but perturbed. What I'm concerned about is uh, there is a direction that seems to be uh, happening uh, in that we've now heard from Ecos Research that uh, Canadians have very negative views about immigrants, 
and we've seen the direction that is going in the U.S. with uh, completely rampant kinds of um, racism expression, mm -hmm. and um, so I'm I'm wondering about the role, the interplay between the state and the children, like. You, you're leaving it up to individuals and individual decision making. I guess I'm asking, does the state have some responsibility here in terms of um, enhancing media uh, that does uphold um, some sort of humane um, communication? I think that would be nice, but, <laughs> but I don't know that that's achievable because the mores change so quickly over time um, that it's, it's hard, to, you know, what, what we would like people to hear and see today might be different from what we would like them to hear and see tomorrow. I think that it would be, I think it, it, teachers are obliged, whether they actually do or not is a different story, but they, they are obliged to give kids, uh, you know, a panoply of views, a diversity of, uh, of views, and get them to learn to think critically. I think it's only critical thinking that's going to be able to deal with the hatred that is out there. I don't think that banning it would for a moment uh, do anything to benefit society. And the, the reason that I believe that also comes from the Weimar Republic. You know, during the Weimar Republic, there were laws that um, punished people for anti-Semitic speech. And they did it successfully, too. Apparently, according to the rabbis of the time, there were prosecutions for anti-Semitic speech. There were um, people who went to jail for it. This is, uh, yeah, including Hitler, but even prior to Hitler. What it resulted in was you know, Platform. yeah, Platform. it was platforms and it was also martyrdom. So people who, you know, had been kind of minimal became uh, heroic because they'd gone to jail for, for, their, for this speech. So I'm, I'm very concerned that if we go after people for saying terrible things, that we're, we're going to do the wrong thing. We're, we're going to end up giving them more of an opportunity than they would have otherwise had if we had ignored them or if we'd gone about our business teaching kids the kinds of stuff we would rather hope they'd learn. Anyway. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. Yeah, I very much agree with what you both said. I'm not articulate like you folks, so bear with me. I've been to a couple of events recently, and um, I think about these issues a lot because um, I was, for example, at one event that was a town hall. There was a poli there were several politicians there, and I was interested to. It was a chance to have a Q and A around issues of racism and Islamophobia, and there were some people at the event who had an issue with the issue. <laughs> and so um, when people on the panel attempted to speak, several people would get up and start shouting and sort of shutting them down. And then the rest of us would be like, wait a minute, we're trying to hear. And anyway, in the end, it was just awful. Nobody really heard anything. Nobody said anything. And it was like, what the hell was that? And, and it was so awful that at one point, one of the politicians there said, I don't want to do this, but I think I'm going to have to call the police because people want to have a chance to speak, blah, blah, blah. And he didn't want to call the police, and he didn't, and but it just kind of all petered out, and it was just, it was not nice. A bit of a mess, yeah. <laughs> no, it was a mess. And then um, recently I was at this um, Unite Against Racism rally just a couple of weeks ago, and for the most part it was great, and there were lots of different groups there, but also Faith Goldie was there and her ilk, and um, I guess they were chanting and shouting a few things, and a couple of times scuffles broke out, but I think part of it was that there were, some people felt keen to maybe be seen to be shutting down Faith and her people. Therefore, it actually resulted in fisticuffs a couple of times. And that, to me, was then a distraction from, from what was actually happening, kind of the good energy and the collectivism around the issues. So it was just, it was just weird, but it's, it's hard to deal with it, I think, in the moment, you know? And I, I know sometimes inside myself, I get so riled up, I, I could, you know, be like, just, uh, but, <laughs> but I know that's not, you know. I feel, I feel that way as well. I had um, a friend in university who objected very strongly to a man who was giving a, a, 
a racist speech. This was uh, a long time ago. This guy called um, Banfield. Uh, and um, my friend decided that the way to deal with it was to physically remove Banfield from the stage. So <laughs> two of them, uh, friends, <laughs> went up picked the guy up and took him off the stage. And they were uh, uh, kicked out of university. And I remember thinking at the time, because I was very young at the time, thinking you know they had every right to do what they did. And it took me a while uh, to go back and, and think, you know, that wasn't the right thing for them to do. Pick it out front of it, uh, ask for equal time, make, you know, ask questions from the floor, you know, embarrass the guy, do, but, but don't remove him from the stage, which was an act of violence as well. I had the opportunity to see my friend ag again about 35 years later, and I said to him, he's, he's now a professor of law, and um, he did, <laughs> yeah, anyway. <laughs> I, and I, and I, I said to him, do you, do you think you'd do that again? He said, no, and I don't think I'd be 21 again either. <laughs> But you know, I I, th I think that that's you know there is that passion of the moment, and then there's the maturity of learning what to do with it, right? Yeah, yeah. If I may, one sidebar thing, which may be completely off topic, in which case you don't have to respond at all. It just flashed into my head this thing that Rob uh, Doug Ford <laughs> is um, trying to put through that's going to require gas stations to have this sticker. <laughs> That I can't remember the exact wording, but essentially it's like a, it might as well be an anti-carbon tax type of sticker. And if they don't have this sticker displayed, there's going to be this $10,000 fine. Where does that fit into? Yeah, we, actually, Kara and I were just speaking about that before we, we, we came up. Um, I, think it's, I think it's compelled speech. I think it's uh, unreasonable um, and, and possibly and unconstitutional. unconstitutional. <laughs> um, yeah. And um, there's a blog about it on the CCLA um, site, and there was a Globe editorial about it a couple of days ago. Um, you know, initially when I heard about it, I thought that it was um, uh, like a labeling requirement. So, like, it, it's technically compelled speech for, you know, the fact that we require food to have, yeah, yeah, to have a calorie count or the ingredients listed. Um, but to me, those are reasonable forms of free speech that are conveying information. Um, and if this was going to be just a breakdown of, you know, here's where your dollar, your tax dollar, your your gas dollar is going to, um, but it, but the notice is actually, it's it's really an ad for the provincial government, and it's a, it's a, it's an ad against the federal government, um, and it directs people to a website. It says, you know, for more information about gas prices visit this website and you go to the website and it's not a lot about gas prices but a lot about how the carbon tax is bad and Ontario has a better way um, and I think it's it's compelled speech and um, and I think it's also potentially an interference in the federal election campaign <laughs> um, so um, yeah we're, we're looking at that one closely and, and my question is isn't Ford's family in the business of making labels? <laughs> <laughs> Just a question. Just a question. <laughs> okay, is there anyone who wants to ask question who has it first? Before we go? Okay, last question. Man in the white shirt. <laughs> okay. Uh, one could argue that uh, choosing the pronoun you'd like to be known by is, a freedom, is freedom of expression. You could argue that point. Yes. <laughs> so just to get to the point, uh, freedom of expression has been taken up as a banner by Jordan Peterson. And he's become a world-renowned intellectual. And he started you know, his campaign <laughs> based on this type of thing, where he says that he can, he can challenge that, for example. So here you have the word, the expression, freedom of expression, being basically taken as a label for somebody who is challenging the right for somebody else to have freedom of expression. How do you deal with the fact that when you've got a book like this and people hear about this for children, how do they not begin to associate them there in their minds this slogan, freedom of expression, with people like Jordan Peterson? 
you ask them to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I... Or you send the CCLET into their class. That's or, right. Yeah. I mean, I think the whole point of writing a book like this is, is, to do, is, is to take the expression, freedom of expression, out of that basket and, and to, you know, to try to get kids to realize from an early age that they have a right and one of, they have rights for full stop and one of the rights is freedom of expression and that that's not the purview of any particular political viewpoint. Um, you know, if, if, if Jordan Peterson had been taught good manners early on, <laughs> I think we wouldn't be where we are today, you know. Somebody should have said, if somebody asks you to call them they, them, use they, them and there, then you do it because it doesn't hurt you, you know. And that's, you know, boy, boy, we, there, there's a wonderful, wonderful kids book uh, by Mo Willems who, who wrote all of the um, Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus books. And uh, he wrote a book called The Naked Mole Rat Gets Dressed. And it's all about a naked mole rat. It's a perfect freedom of expression <laughs> book for two and a half year olds. Uh, you know, and so the, the, there's a naked mole rat named Wilbur who puts clothes on and everybody goes, ew, yuck. Um, that's gross, you know, because he's wearing clothes and the rest of them are naked. And uh, the, the, the question that the great authority, the grandpa, asks at the end is, you know, do clothes hurt anybody? No. You know, so if, if, if Wilbur wants to wear clothes, Wilbur can wear clothes. And I think that that's kind of the level where Jordan Peterson should, <laughs> should have been reached. <laughs> you know, if that person wants to be called they, it doesn't hurt you, just <laughs> let them be called they. Yes. Well, that's probably a, a good way to end it. <laughs> <laughs>